Welcome to the One and O podcast hosted by Joe Cook and Brad Kellner. We're part of the Everyone Gets a Trophy podcast channel. And today we are going to review Big 12 Media Days, what we heard from a Texas perspective, as well as some things from some of the other schools who are remaining part of the Big 12. We'll also get into Malik Muhammad's commitment to Texas, choosing the Longhorns over Alabama and Texas A&M before discussing the non-conference for Texas men's basketball here ahead of the 2022-2023 season. So, Brad, first time in a while you have not been to Big 12 Media Days, man in the fort with the horn. They uh, not, not something the, the Houston station wants to send you to, apparently, with you know a bunch of NBA draft, Astros heating up, NFL heating up, and training camp around the corner. It's it's hard to find time when, when you're in a pro sports town for, hey, for college athletics. Maybe in a couple of years, once Houston joins the Big 12, they'll be sending me up there to uh, Big 12 media days. And there might be a year or two where Texas and Houston are in the same conference, right? As of now, that's the plan. So we'll obviously see if Texas and Oklahoma depart the Big 12 before 2025. But yeah, it was weird not being there. I missed it. Always love interacting with the media. I always love interacting with the players and coaches. And for a lot of people, myself included, it sort of feels like the start of the college football season. It it really tells me that we're getting close and that it's right around the corner. And short, sure enough, we're like 40 something days away from kickoff this year. So it's close, man, but I missed it. What uh, what were some of your big takeaways from the two days of happenings up at Jerry World? Well, you know how one year you and Trey interviewed the the Mountaineer? Yes. So now. There is an official beef jerky of the Big 12, and it is Old Trapper Beef Jerky. <laughs> and the guy looks like, you know, let's say the Mountaineer at West Virginia is the, the college Mountaineer. This guy's a professional Mountaineer. He's an old oh. trapper. And uh, you would have you would have gotten a kick out of out of that guy. But uh, no, let's let's go ahead and get into the, the Texas storylines from from Big 12 Media Days. Um, and they, to me, it started with the introduction of the new commissioner Uh, because I think a lot of people went to big 12 media days, just trying to figure out, is there going to be any news on when all when Texas and Oklahoma make their exit? I think it's already known that U of H BYU Cincinnati and UCF they're coming in to begin. uh, I think July 1st, 2023. So Texas and Oklahoma, everybody involved keep pointing to July 1st, 2025 as the date they're going to make their exit for the SEC. And of course, both went out and are likely angling to get out. And But nobody publicly acknowledged that for the longest time until the new commissioner, Brett Yormark, said, you know what, I'm looking for a win-win scenario. And that's the first time anybody, whether it's Chris Del Conte, Joe Castiglione, um, Jay Hartzell, Joseph Arose, Greg Sankey over in the SEC, Bob Bowlesby, Everybody else had said July 1st, 2025, July 1st, 2025. That's the first time that anybody involved even hints a little bit publicly at, yeah, it could be done earlier. It could not be done earlier too, Mm -hmm. but that's the first hint we got from anybody involved and from the new Big 12 commissioner, no less, that they could, you know, with if the price is right, negotiate an earlier exit for Texas and Oklahoma. Man, that's a great point. You're right. I mean, Brett Yormark, the first person to even hint towards that being a possibility. I think most fans realize that is a possibility, right? And we know how much money Texas has. We know Oklahoma has some pretty good money too. Like we know there's a scenario in which the sides agree to a buyout and they pay their way out of the Big 12 and into the SEC before 2025 when those TV rights deals expire. But yeah, everyone's been keeping it close to the vest, right? Everyone's been saying, nope, that's the date. We're waiting until then. Uh, It's nice to not be lied to, Joe, because we know. Look, I I understand, like, CDC has to say that. I don't want to criticize him or President Hartzell for any of that because, like, that's the contract. That's what they have to say. But it's nice to not be lied to because, like, we know in a perfect world, Texas and Oklahoma can get to the SEC next year. Like, they don't want to stay in this conference with those four new schools. They don't want to stay here for three more years. The reason they're joining the SEC is because they want to be in the SEC and they want to get there as soon as they possibly can. So, Look, I've said for a long time, and maybe I'm wrong, and I'll eat my words if I'm wrong, but I was saying this doing radio in Austin, and I think we've talked about it on this podcast. I don't think Texas and Oklahoma play in a conference with Houston, UCF, BYU, and Cincinnati, which would mean this is the last year for Texas and Oklahoma 
in the Big 12. Once again, as of now, we don't know that, but like that's my thought. My thought is it always has been once those other teams are about to join, that's when Texas and Oklahoma say we're too good for this. Whether you like it or not, like that, they'll say, nah, we don't want to be a part of this new thing. We're going to the SEC where we feel like we belong. So, I, man, it, it's nice that your mark actually hinted to that being a possibility because, Joe, I think you and I and everybody realize that both sides, really all three sides, if you include the two schools and the conference, uh, want this thing to happen sooner rather than later. And before even USC and UCLA made their move, I was kind of thinking, you know what, this may just be hard business. You know, you got to pay the money and you can go if you pay it, but you got to pay the money. Now with all this movement and everything being thrown into a lurch, it's hard for me. I still think that if you put percentages or odds on outcome, those would be the best odds. But I don't know if it's just the far and away stone cold lock like like it, it seemed to be. Um, I mean, even today, you'll see people throwing stuff at the wall, trying to, you know, gain some traction online by saying like, oh, the four corner schools are going to go or, or stuff like that. Like uh, it, it's. Uh, there's a lot of stuff being thrown at walls right now, um, especially even within California still uh, when it comes to UCLA, a public institution leaving. Um, and it, it, it has to do with Notre Dame, has to do with the ACC. There's just so much different going on. But yeah, like you mentioned, it seems like the odds are, are better now for Texas to be able to do that next year uh, with everything, all the crazy stuff that has happened. A, just because it will A, because of that crazy stuff and B, because, you know, they probably don't want to be in that conference without what they probably perceive as a lower Big 12, I guess to say, or a weaker yeah. Big 12, even though it'll probably still as a college football fan and even as a college basketball fan and a little bit as a college baseball fan, be a pretty fun conference. No doubt. It'd be a fun conference to be a part of for a couple of years, but I just don't think Texas and Oklahoma want to be a part of it. You bring up college basketball, it'd be the best college basketball conference in the country. Hell, even if Texas and Oklahoma leave when those other schools arrive, you can make a case that the Big 12 is the best college basketball conference in the country because they're adding a Houston team that's, what, been to the Sweet 16 the last three seasons, made it to a Final Four a couple of years ago in Elite Eight this past season, so... Three uh, final yeah. four teams, you know, yeah. Cincinnati's all, Cincinnati's a good basketball school and BYU can find a Mormon who can shoot from 30 yeah, feet I mean, every they, now and then. They've got like 32 year olds on their team. So every once in a while they find a really good one. So, yeah, I mean, look, for me, from a Texas perspective, like that was the one thing I really cared about Brett Yormark talking about from a college football perspective. Obviously, I was fascinated to hear his thoughts on realignment, right? Because Big 12 had the first major conference media days, and it was after the USC-UCLA news dropped. So I wanted to hear what he had to say about that. But I'll be honest, Joe, from like a, a, a Texas perspective, that was like the most important thing to me. Of course, we got the horns down question asked, which is ridiculous. It, it cracks me up, Joe. I'm going to take a shot at Austin Media, and you're not a part of this, and I'm not a part of this, but I'll lump the whole group together so I don't single anybody out. Leading up to media days every year, Somebody tweets out, oh, who's going to be the person to ask the commissioner about horns down this year? And then it's always somebody from Austin Media who asked the question. It's like they're, they're trying to get somebody else to ask it. Nobody else cares except for the Austin Media about asking the horns down question, which pisses me off. But sidebar, I didn't care about that. Uh, really, that was the main thing I cared about. Like, were we going to get any information about Texas's departure to the SEC? And perhaps we got a little bit from uh, your bar. Yeah, but we'll see. He he still hasn't even taken the job over yet. But um, yeah. from what I from what I've heard, you know, Texas and Oklahoma were I don't know if they chose him, but they were assuredly involved in the process of his selection. Uh, and, and he's someone who knows big business. I mean, he that was a key part of moving the Mets or the Nets from New Jersey to Brooklyn um, and worked for Jay Z. And that guy's all about business. So uh, yeah. this one's this one's going to be fun to track. But you know, they also did talk football uh, at, at Big 12 Media Days, um, surprisingly enough. And one of the things that, of course, was going to be the, the focus for Steve Sarkeesian's crew was the quarterback battle. Um, when you talk to Dave Aranda, who was on there the day before uh, discussing his defending Big 12 champs, they made the decision to go with Blake Shapin ahead of Gary Bohannon before spring ball or right as spring ball ended and before the May 1st transfer portal deadline. Steve Sarkeesian didn't do that, but one thing he did say about the question that he got constantly uh, about the quarterback battle, most of them about Quinn Ewers, was he believes he can do it, he can make a decision a little earlier this year. 
And that's because they have two hours per week of skill training with football, with coaches on the field. Uh, so he did say that they were going to, uh, you know, give both Hudson Card and Quinn Ewers the chance to compete in pads before making a decision. But most of the, with good reason, most of the questions centered around Quinn Ewers, but Steve Sarkeesian refused to take the bait and hint at anything ahead of the upcoming quarterback battle. Yeah, no surprise at all, right? I think we've been expecting this, and Sark sort of had the same tone throughout the entirety of the offseason, and pretty much since Quinn Ewers got on campus throughout the course of the spring, it was how both guys are getting run with the first team. At the spring game, you saw both guys get some run with the, if there was a first team. Of course, they didn't have enough offensive linemen to really have two separate teams, but both of those guys got a pretty equal number of snaps uh, for that spring game, and yeah, that's uh, no surprise that that's still the case. So I'll be honest, Joe, like, I think it was August 28th when we found out that uh, Hudson Card was going to be the starter last year. Like it was the Friday before the first game of the season. So like eight days before the first game, if memory serves, I was a little surprised. We, we had found out as early as we did. Some people say oh, that's not early. That's the week before the game. I, I didn't know if we'd find out at all. Like there was a part of me that thought Sark would not say anything and just all well, the first guy out there against the Raging Cajuns was going to be the starter. So I take him at his word with this. Like, I thought he was a little bit early last year. Now he's saying he wants to be even earlier this year. Uh, I, I hope, I think, and I hope, obviously, that Sark makes a decision that he feels good about and does it with enough time to where everybody in the locker room knows. And the last two weeks going into the ULM game, you've got one guy working with the ones, and that guy is the only guy working with the ones. Like, that's hopefully a decision is made by then to where, like, everybody is rowing the boat, P.J. Fleck, in the same direction with the same quarterback. Uh, I think we all expect it to be Quinn Ewers, but that's that's what I would want to happen. Like, we have an answer early enough, and the guys in the locker room and the quarterbacks, of course, too, know what's going on before the week of the first game. You know, what's the old cliche? Usually the team, the members of the team know before the, the coaches do or yeah. something like that. Uh, maybe that's what happens this year. And, and I, I try to be extremely fair on this because I'm, I'm with you. I, at the end of the day, I expect it to be Quinn Ewers. I expect him to have to perform better in that quarterback battle than Hudson Card. I just that's the long and short of it. But you can't go ahead anointing him on seven, you know, on July 21st before they've even had a helmet and shorts practice, let, a, let alone a padded practice. It's just not how I operate. And, you know, Hudson Card could go out there and just start tearing it up. He's like, oh, well, you know, what about in games? It's like, well, they do have some stuff to base off of, but they base, they see more practice in games. It's, it's a tough decision that I'm glad Steve Sarkeesian is going to let play out and not uh, – because, A, because he has to. I don't think mm -hmm. that was the exact same case with Baylor. I think Blake Shapin was clearly ahead. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, A, because he has to, and, B, just so, you know, he can – like you said, get that decision and then unify ahead of it going into the season. So yeah. And keep um, the competition going too, right? Like if you announce Quinn Ewers as the starter right now, it's like, ah, shit, I don't have to work anymore. Like I already have the job. And uh, like, you don't want that. You want to like let both of these guys know that they have a chance. And I think Shark is being honest. Like I think both guys do have a chance right now. You want to increase that competition. So, you know, guys are going to put in the work to try to win that battle. Right. So uh, what about the offensive line? That was the other big question uh heading into this uh uh media days um uh, and chip brown had a pretty good question it was you know can you tell if these guys are ready yet and steve sarkeesian said no and i think it goes back to a little bit what we were talking about with quarterbacks with you know it, they, these guys deserve padded practices and and one thing i was kind of interested in hearing about from ovia gofu who made his way to big 12 media days is, you know, he describes all these offensive linemen as giant humans, you know, Cam Williams is six, seven, three, 74. Dude. And uh, over you go, said like, you know, I looked up at him and was wondering if he was, you know, if he was that big and DeMarvin Overshone said, you know, people don't look like that in ARP Texas. <laughs> uh, but one thing I was curious about with, with Ovi was, you know, how physical are these off season workouts with the football? Because they can't have pads. It's just shorts and shoulder pads, or it's, excuse me, shorts and T-shirts. And, you know, you've seen videos from those recruiting camps and all those different things. You can, you can bump chests a little bit. You can get after it. But it's not the same as, you know, down by down, snap by snap, uh, playing with pads on and going all out. And Ovi Gofu said, you know what, we're not, 
you know, we're physical, we're bumping, but we're not going all out. We're not, you know, it's, it's shorts and shirts. I don't really know a better way to put it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big reason why Steve Sarkeesian said, you know, I can't tell yet. Uh, But at the same time, based on everything we hear inside Texas and uh, just based on the, the quality of those guys that they brought in, it's so difficult to think that that, you know, one, if not two, and then who knows, maybe even three jobs on that offensive line aren't going to be belonging to true freshmen. And that's kind of scary considering Dallas Turner and Will Anderson are in town. Yeah. But Steve Sarkeesian said it best. Uh, I think he said this in reference to quarterbacks, and maybe it applies to offensive line too. I would apply it that way. It's like, why would I play these guys against, you know, the bad, the bad team? He didn't say that. When and then then not playing for against you know the best team in college football like don't, I'm not going to kids glove them, mm. so I think the big question heading into media days that needed to be answered was you know are these guys making the progress necessary in order to be on track to start if need be and it sounds like the answer is yes but he didn't anoint them as a starter yeah and I appreciate that honesty from Sark too right talked about that with Brett Yormark a couple of minutes ago now I appreciate Sark being honest about the offensive line because if Sark said no I I love the guys that we've had on campus I feel great about them and I feel great about our offensive line going into this season I'd call BS I'd say there's no way how can you feel good about that unit they were not very good last year and they lost some of their best pieces from a year ago And yeah, I don't know how you can bank on a bunch of true freshmen coming in and making an impact right away when you haven't even seen a lot of them put the pads on like you were talking about. So uh, I appreciate that honesty. And Joe, I'm a broken record with this. Like you guys at IT do a great job recording. I obviously believe everything y'all say, but I'm not going to believe anything about the offensive line until I see it against ULM. And of course, like if they're good against ULM, great. Then they got to go up against Alabama. Now, those are two complete opposite ends of the spectrum, right? Like, if they look bad against ULM, uh-oh, we're in trouble. <laughs> Bet the farm on Bama minus whatever the hell they are. But, like, if they look really good against ULM, it's like, ah, well, it's ULM. If they look really bad against Alabama, we know Texas isn't there yet. So, like, you can't be like, oh, this offensive line sucks. But it's obviously, as the year progresses, we'll wait and see what this offensive line looks like. But yeah, man, I, I'm in total wait and see mode. Like I've just heard so many things about these offensive lines over the last 12 years in the off season where it's like, now nah, we feel good about what we have or now nah, we're so much better than last year. And then we put the pads on Saturdays in the fall and they don't live up to it. So I love the recruiting class. I love that Sark and Kyle floods put a serious emphasis on bringing in offensive linemen. Texas needed it. God knows Texas needed it. But uh, when your most talented guys are, are all true freshmen, it's hard to know what to expect it's hard to come up with super reasonable logical ex, uh, expectations for these guys in year one I think down the road this offensive line is going to be very very good but how quickly will uh, some of these new faces be able to adapt to the college game and that's going to determine how good this offense is because Joe like a lot of people are praising this offense everybody knows how good Bijan is the receivers are loaded Quinn Ewers highly touted recruit we, we know what he could be but none of that matters if the offensive line is is what it has been so like that, people don't talk about those guys enough, but they are going to be the key to whether or not this Texas offense can put up 40 plus points per game. And they might have to because we're not sure about what this defense is going to look like. Yeah, that that leads in perfectly to the next point. And I think that's the way to say it. You know, I'll steal your line again. You win football in the trenches. Steve Sarkeesian believes that. And, you know, whether the trenches will do enough for Texas this year, that's the big question on offense. But yeah, the defense is big too. And it seems like this year they're, they're not – they still don't have the exact specs necessary – or not specs, but the exact players they like and able to truly run that two four five. It's going to be a little modified. It's going to have some uh, – you know, it, it's going to have a lot of what Pete Kwiatkowski likes to do. But it's not that exact two four five because I don't know if they have the, the edge guys – that they need. And they went after a few guys in the portal. They just didn't get them. And that's on them. And, you know, those recruiting losses could come home to roost this year. But, you know, the, the big question with the defense, it, it boils down to something real simple. And it's, are, are you going to be better? Like, it, it really is that simple. You can go, you know, will the corners turn and look for the ball? Will the, run, will the linebackers be able to work in the trenches? Will there be a pass rush? Will they hold the edge? I mean, that's just all to say, will they be better? Um, and I guess you could pair 
that question, along with the question that was often asked at Big 12 Media Days, what impact does Gary Patterson have on the program? And Steve Sarkeesian spoke a lot about that, mostly from a program-wide perspective, not a side-of-the-ball-wide perspective. But hey, you know, you can't deny that he's right there. And he called great defenses for decades in the Big 12. And if things start to go awry, granted, they are not exactly overlapping when it comes to their systems, Pete Kwiatkowski and, and Gary Patterson. But still, if things go awry, you know, he's still there. Yeah. He, he, that's, that's just an undeniable fact. Yeah, you hate even bringing that up, right? Because you hope it doesn't come to fruition. But no, there's no doubt. I mean, if this year doesn't go the way that Texas needs it to go and Sark's seat's starting to warm up a little bit, then he won't hesitate. We saw it with Tom Herman. We saw it with Charlie Strong. Like, you you make moves to your coaching staff if uh, it's getting a little rocky for you as the head coach. So hopefully that doesn't happen. But you're right. This defense has to be better. They were 93rd in the country last year in points per game allowed. Like, that's the most important stat to me. Uh, you can give up yards. If you buckle up in the red zone and, and force field goals, you're going to be fine, especially if this offense lives up to the billing. But you can't be giving up 31-plus points per game like Texas did a season ago like that. You just can't bank on that. And hell, you had a couple of non-conference gimmies in there too, that lowered the points per game average against uh, Texas a season ago. So yeah, I mean, for this team to take the step for this team to compete in the big 12, obviously they got to be higher than 93rd in college football, Joe, in terms of points per game allowed. So I'm not expecting an elite group. If you gave any of them truth serum on campus, I don't think they'd expect an elite group, but Man, like be around the top 50, please, mm -hmm. in terms of points per game allowed. I don't think that's too much to ask. You've got experience. You've got recruiting talent. Like, try to find a way to at least be close to the top 50 at Texas. If that's the case, then you've got a shot to uh, to make some noise in this league this year. Yeah, I mean, if uh, you mentioned it, if you're a bend but don't break defense, which can be really frustrating watching, but if it if you don't break – and you have this offense, you'll take that four point deficit or that four point advantage uh, every time. But if you're a bend but don't break defense and you break, you have no chance because then you can't go ahead and pivot and be like, oh, we're going to be aggressive attack, you know, blitz, blitz, all this stuff, press coverage. You just don't have that in your, in your repertoire. It's not what you do. So if they're going to run that type of defense again, then, uh, you know, they better not break or else there's going to be some problems. So yeah. um, anything else from the, the guys they brought there, Roshan Johnson, Bijan Robinson, Ovia Gofu, and, and DeMarvian Overshown? Uh, it's another Sark question, but uh, what you make of, what'd you make of Sark being asked about his future in the NFL and whether or not he'd be getting calls or looks from the NFL? What'd you make of that question? I thought that was an interesting one. And granted, when, if somebody were to ask Tom Herman or Charlie Strong that, I'd laugh it out of the room. Like, <laughs> you know, let, let's be realistic here. It does make a little bit more sense with Steve Sarkeesian, con considering he has a couple of years, I think a hand, like no more than three or four uh, years of experience in the NFL, uh, especially as an offensive coordinator. Uh, and that was as basic uh, – he oversaw his entire side of the ball because he was with Dan Quinn, who's a defensive guy. So it, it makes sense from that perspective, just seeing that he's been in the NFL before. But Steve Sarkeesian talks so much about how much he loves college football and how he likes recruiting. Even with all the, the crap that coaches have to go through recruiting via the portal, NIL, all this different stuff. Earlier and earlier, recruiting sophomores, recruiting – freshman, all the different stuff. He still mentions he likes college football, likes watching it, likes being involved with it. So it made sense, but I think he likes college football enough. I think obviously the results last year and his head coaching record make it tough for a lot of people to take that question seriously, which I get, you know, it's a, what have you done for me lately league? And unless you're Jeff Fisher um, and, you know, people want to see success and, Granted, he had great offenses, but his win and loss record still leaves a lot to be desired. I I mean, I get it. And again, you have to remember, this is a, a way at Big 12 Media Days for them to just kind of grab content to bring you through stuff. Uh, so 
if you had asked Tom, it made more sense asking Steve yeah. Sarkeesian compared to Tom Herman or Charlie Strong. Uh, but still, I don't, unless he goes and like you know 15 and 0 and wins a national title this year, I don't think it's a question that we really need to worry about the the real answer to for at at this point. Yeah, boy, I hope Sark is not Jeff Fisher, right? What's the college equivalent to seven and nine? Is it five and seven? Like I I pray that's not what we're gonna have to deal with. with is it Bo uh, Pelini just going nine and <laughs> nine and four every year? Oh and man! Not, but which I mean, hey, look at that now and look. They at, kill for that now in Nebraska. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Like I'm with you hundred percent. Look, I, I liked Sark's answer. I didn't love it. I wish he laughed it off. I wish he scoffed it off the way you would have scoffed at that question. If it was asked to Tom Herman or Charlie Strong. I wish he would have been like, seriously, like you're asking me that after one year in the year that we had last year. Are you kidding? Come on now. I liked his answer. I didn't love it, but you're right. And, and, and I don't think Sark, I didn't hear the question. I saw it on Twitter. This was not a part of the press conference. So like, I, I didn't get any audio of this, but um, like, I don't think it was worded as head coaching offers. Like, I think Sark could get an offensive coordinator offer next offseason. Like, if Texas's offense puts up 40 points per game this season and Quinn Ewers looks really good and Bijan Robinson's a first round pick, like, I could see an NFL team calling about an offensive coordinator job. He won't get paid as much. No, no, I don't think he would take it. But, like, that's why I don't think the question is that outlandish. Like, I think with a good offensive year, everybody knows how good of an offensive mind he can be. Now, with the Falcons, it didn't end great, but I still think he'd get another chance as an OC if Texas had a really, really good offensive season. So, that's why I don't think it's that outlandish. Like, like as a head coach, obviously, he's going to have to be really, really good to get any consideration next year. But if the offense is good – I could see a team calling him about an OC vacancy, but like you said, I, I don't think there's any chance he would leave Texas for, for that role. Yeah, I don't think so either. And I can't even remember. I don't think Texas has ever had a coach leave for the a head coach leave for the NFL. Yeah. We haven't had a Lincoln Riley thing happen either. Have we? Or coach Not, leaves for another coaching job. No, they've paid? either retired or been fired. Yeah. Yeah, as it happens. So mm-hmm. um, anything else from the Texas side or you want to dive in a little bit uh, into the Red River and swim across real quick? Yeah, I know you've got some thoughts on the Sooners and, and kind of how their fans are treating this season. So uh, let, let's talk a little bit about Oklahoma. I want to hear what you got for us. All right. So flash all the way back to December of last year. I decided to listen to the OU Rivals podcast right after – uh, they decided or at, the day after Lincoln Riley left and it was kind of to have some entertainment, but I think it was, I forgot who it was. It was the guy, it's the publisher. It's either, uh, Josh, I, 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 will, I can't remember, hmm. but he kind of stops the podcast and goes, guys, we've never covered a coaching search. And I think there's so many OU fans who and granted, this is a great credit to their program since 1999. That, in, and even before then, they went from, uh, I don't know, but th- that was a program that you look at it and you think consistency outside of about five years in the 90s and a little bit of NCAA problems. Like you go from Wilkinson to the guy who left for the Patriots, I forget his name, I think, to, uh, Barry Switzer, you know, you have your problems with the NCAA and then the nineties uh, you have some bad hires and then you get stoops and you get Riley. This like, this is, these are fans and programs used to nothing but consistency and nothing but really good football. And I think they see Brent Venables who is kind of from the family um, and had success at Oklahoma kind of reminds them of, of Bob Stoops a little bit and think, oh, everything's going to be fine. But there's there's no way. Like, this is a first-time head coach. And granted, he's been under some of the best in Bob Stoops and, and Dabo Sweeney, but he's never had to call every shot, which is a big deal. He's also not a play caller, I think, or he's going to cede a lot of play calling to Ted Roof, who I don't think has called plays, at least at an Oklahoma-type level, in a long time. He's given up a brand new offensive system in Jeff Levy. They have to reinvigorate a culture. They have 15 transfers and they have a quarterback who's never played power five football. And there's just this sweeping, you know, idea thoughts among sooner, even some media. And I love him to death that Eddie Radosevich was saying this, like, you know, why shouldn't we expect 10 wins? It's like, look, man, first years suck. 
like they do. You have to change so much and you're counting on Brent Venables, who's never had to thread needles before, threading five different needles this year, you know, to win 10 games and get back to the Big 12 title game. Yeah. That's a lot that has to go perfect with a quarterback who's probably smaller than you to get to that point. And I think it's just a lot of Oklahoma fans are like, well, you know, we're always used to this. Like, this is how it works here. It's, it's not going to change. And, hey, Texas fans are just as guilty of that as well. But I, I, I don't see – I feel like uh, Oklahoma fans are going to succumb to similar results and similar, you know, observations that Texas fans have, have had over this past decade. Yeah, I think I'm higher on 2022 Oklahoma than you are, but uh, perhaps there's some delusion going on amongst that fan base. And obviously time will tell if that's right. But, you know, it's funny at this time last year, Joe, Lincoln Riley was the best coach in college football. Yeah, uh, they loved him. I mean, he was God, Jesus, Moses, Allah, all the above. Like he, he was the best ever. And of course, he leaves and takes the job at USC. And now I see like one tweet a day that says, oh, Lincoln Riley sucked. Here's a stat that shows you that Lincoln Riley's team's got worse every year. When yeah. The stat actually doesn't prove that. It's just Oklahoma people don't know how to read. So TDOW, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, they struggle putting it together. So, of course, they've turned. And look, like any fan base would do that, right? Like uh, that that's just how sports works, right? You love a guy when he's on your side. You hate a guy when he's on the other side. That's just how it goes. But, yeah, I mean, you, you brought it up, man. Like Brent Venables has never been a head coach before. And he's going to a top five program of all time in Oklahoma. Yeah, he's been there as a DC, but it's different than being a head coach. And you laid it out perfectly. And it'd be one thing if like Oklahoma had its team intact from last year. Like if they had just about everybody back from that 11 win team a season ago that played for a Big 12 title and won a bowl game, then okay. Like I could see them maybe being right there. But, I mean, they lost two NFL-caliber quarterbacks. Ian Boyd, your cohort at IT, tweeted this out, and you kind of talked about it. But they lost two really good quarterbacks to the portal. Uh, six of their seven best defenders they lost, either to the portal or to the NFL. They lost their two best offensive linemen. They lost a future NFL tight end. And they lost, like, one of the best offensive minds in the sport, not only in college football, but, like, in the entire sport. So, like, just to assume that it's all going to be gravy and it's going to be smooth sailing this year, I think is crazy. Now, once again, I think Oklahoma is going to be pretty good. I have them go into the Big 12 title game. I don't think they're going to go 11 and 1 or 12 and 0, but like, I, I don't think they're going to take a big step back because just in my lifetime, they've always been good. So I'm going to assume they're going to be good. But, Joe, like you said, to, to just assume that there's no chance that they have a down year, like, I'm not saying the whole Venables era is going to suck, but just to say there's no chance that they have one bad year with all of the turnover that they've had. Like that's that's delusional. And Texas fans have been delusional plenty of times. Don't get me wrong. We're all guilty of it. But that like that is delusional to think that there is no chance that your program takes a step back with all of the changes that you've had this offseason. Best comment I saw was like they went to they won 10 wins last year and it was a down year. I'm like, well, get ready for something else because it could be on the way. So, yeah, I mean, granted, I think Jeff Levy is a really good offensive play caller. There's still talent on that team. Uh, it didn't all leave with Caleb Williams and Lincoln Riley. And Brent Venables brought it in. And, you know, I, I, for a coach who emphasizes culture as much as Dabo Sweeney did, Brent Venables had to have been a big part of that. And I give him credit, but it's still year one of that. And it's a lot to ask all that to just go swimmingly right off the bat. Yeah. So. Um, anything else from <clears throat> Big 12 Media Day? You want to talk a little bit about the uh, the recruiting trail? Uh, let's do recruiting. So we can get into a little bit of the uh, the run that Texas has had, but we'll focus on a couple of uh, South Dallas prospects real quick. The first one, uh, Jonte Cook committed on. Actually, we talked about that, but uh, we'll go. We'll stay in South Dallas anyway. Uh, last night, Malik Muhammad, South Oak Cliff cornerback. Uh, one of the top prospects in the state, one of the top cornerbacks in the country, committed to the Longhorns over Texas A&M and, and Oklahoma, or excuse me, in Alabama. And it's a big win for Texas in a lot of categories. One, number one corner in the state. Always good to get a, a number one guy in the state at his position, especially at the cost of Texas A&M. The yeah. other thing is this helps te <clears throat> Texas enter a place where it really haven't had a whole lot of success in the past decade in, in South Dallas, and especially at South Oak Cliff, which is one of the best stories in, in sports in Texas last year. 
uh, and who also has got this football thing figured out pretty well yeah. uh, to go there and get one of the, the big prospects from that program at the expense of a, a team you're a rival with and B, two teams you're probably going to end up playing in the next few years. That's a big help. No doubt. No doubt about it. And you're right. It's really all of Dallas that Texas has struggled in over the last few years. And there are a bunch of teams going into Dallas, right? Oklahoma gets a lot of its best talent from Dallas. Obviously, A&M's going there, too. Tech's going there. And then you've got the normal powers, the LSU's, Alabama's, Ohio State's. They, they, they pick and choose pretty much whoever they want from all across the country. But, yeah, Dallas has not been super kind to the Longhorns in recent years. I thought Sark did a pretty good job with Dallas this past year, and I think he's doing a pretty good job with the Metroplex this year, too. And, yeah, I mean, Jonte Cook, we don't need to talk about him too much, but Cook and Muhammad are two top 50 players in the country, like not at their position, like top 50 overall in the country, uh, a wide receiver and a defensive back. And in the case of Malik Muhammad, I saw this, Joe. I, I don't know if this is true. I should have verified it. It was on Twitter, so I assume it's true because you can't put anything on the Internet that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, Muhammad, the highest graded corner commit for Texas since 07? Is that right? Uh, I'm not. I, I saw something like that, and it and it makes sense. I mean, even uh, I think a lot of people got caught up in, in the Anthony Cook commitment uh, yeah. or recruitment a few years ago, just because it stretched out so late. Uh, but at the very tail end of that recruitment, his his ranking dived down a little bit. So yeah, um, yeah, it makes sense that Muhammad is is the highest rated corner since. Like, I wonder who that would be back in 08. Yeah. Not Duke Thomas, not Quandre. Who knows? But. Uh -huh. I might look yeah, that, that, that illustrates the point of how big of an ad that he is. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't have enough corners in today's football, right? Like at all levels of football, teams throw the ball more than ever before. Now, at the risk of not talking in circles, I will say maybe the Big 12 10 to 15 years ago threw the ball more than the Big 12 right now. But overall, football in general has become more pass happy than it's ever been. So you can't have enough good corners in this sport, in this league. Hell, the SEC throws the ball like the Big 12 did 10 to 15 years ago uh, pretty much now. So, yeah, you got to have talented corners, talented secondary players to uh, to make sure you can hold your own. And Malik Muhammad, by all accounts, is, is going to be that. So, yeah, it's it's a triple win, right? You you get a win in Dallas. You out-recruit A&M in Alabama. And you get help at a position of need and a position that you've struggled at a lot in recent years. So, uh, all good things with the commitment of Malik Muhammad. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it marks a, I don't want to say the end, but it, it's part of the close of a great July for the Longhorns in the wake of, of Arch Manning committing in, in late June um, and the run that they had after that. And, you know, they still have some big targets on the board. The number one running back in the country and Cedric Baxter, who's out of Orlando, uh, he's set to commit, I think, on August 10th or August 11th. And, you know, that's a recruitment that the Longhorns are looking really good in, too, especially for some heavy hitters. If, if Texas were to gain his commitment, he would be basically flying over all the other schools in his top group of schools in order to get there. Uh, yeah. So that would be, be a big ad. Real quick. So I looked up the 07 recruiting class to see which corner was rated higher than Malik Muhammad. Curtis Brown. Yeah, and he played in the NFL, right? Good call. Yeah, five so, stars. He did 0.9849 composite ranking is what I'm seeing. And Malik Muhammad's got a 0 0.9800. So, yeah, no, if uh, Malik Muhammad's the next Curtis Brown, I won't complain. We'll, we'll take that. Hall of Honor members, member Sam Acho also in that class. And Earl go. Thomas. How did Earl Thomas get ranked as lowly as he did? That's a great uh, question. Man. They missed. Yeah. Uh, you can't win them all, right? Yeah, I guess when you're five nine, you have to win some more battles and – get your brother involved but that's another conversation for another day um one thing that did come out today however was uh chris beard's non-conference schedule for the 2022 2023 season for uh texas longhorns men's basketball and i think you and i both realize that chris beard has a way of scheduling that he's not going to deviate from some of the games on the schedule he doesn't really get to choose those are the strongest games. A lot of the games on the schedule, he does get to choose. And granted, transfers kind of throw this all for a loop. They didn't really have very good Kim Palm scores last year. But with all that said, it's still a decently balanced schedule with some high-profile games, some interesting games, especially in uh, not just in the Rio Grande Valley, but in the Garden in New York City and also in uh, 
in Gregory Gym, but of course in the Moody Center uh, ahead of what should be a really interesting year for for the Longhorn basketball program. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. I, I like this non-con schedule more than I like last year's non-conference schedule. And you're right, like I, I, Chris Beard might not have a say in all of these games, and some games are made because of TV contracts, and you've got those conference v. conference battles that uh, obviously add a couple of games to your schedule, but some fun ones in the non-con this year. You get Gonzaga again, and this time they're in your house. So hopefully uh, turnabout is fair play, and you can find a way to – I'll take any win over those guys. But obviously, if you could beat them down the way they kind of beat Texas down last year in the kennel, uh, that'd be pretty nice. But yeah, Creighton. Dude, Creighton's going to be the Big East favorite. Creighton's going to be a top-10 team to start the year. Like, they, they might be. They probably should be rated higher than the Longhorns to begin the season. So, like, that's – I'm talking about a litmus test right there. Creighton's going to be really freaking good. Uh, they almost beat Kansas in the second round last year without two of their best players. And those guys are back. They brought in a really good transfer in Baylor Shireman. Like they're going to be solid. So that will be a tough test. And then uh, Illinois going up against Brad Underwood again. And uh, Terrence Shannon again. Yeah. And Terrence Shannon again. Yeah. I forgot. Yeah. He's now uh, with the Illini. So that's a good test. Like they're usually a ranked team and, and a contender of the big 10 uh, we'll find out who the Pac-12 opponent is in that coast-to-coast challenge thing at some point. So I think Rothstein said it was Stanford. Okay. Well, that's eh, – okay. It's, well, it, I mean, that's a middling – but that's that's kind of – that kind of leads into a different point. That's kind of where I want the Texas schedule to be. Like finding those 180 to 200 teams, maybe in Ken Palm, maybe in net. Uh, sprinkling in, you know, maybe one or two top 100 teams and then just kind of living in that 100 to 200. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think you can gain the similar, I guess, strategy that you have now of building your team together against maybe some lower quality opponents in the non-conference before you get in the grind that's Big 12 play. I get that, but you don't need to schedule HBU, who's in the 330s or – a m Commerce, who's granted, I think it's because he's AM Commerce's head coach is a buddy of Chris Beard's, but this is our first year of Division One basketball. Like that's not going to be a good team. So yeah, uh, I'm not. But granted, I, I also know not to complain too much about how Chris Beard schedules because it's not like he's going to change. And there's some other problems with the program, at least at this juncture, that may be worthy of complaining about that we can get to when when more details come out. Uh, but you know this. Overall, as a schedule, just independent of Chris Beard, there's some pretty cool high-profile games on there. I just kind of wish more were at the Moody Center for the home crowd. Yeah, I'm with you. And that's fair, right? Like, it's it's two extremes. You're either playing, like, really good top 20 teams or you're playing teams that uh, are, are not good, like outside the Ken Palm top 200, like you said. So maybe it'd be nice for some middling ground to, to kind of prepare you for games against K-State and some of the weaker teams in the Big 12. Uh, I think a lot of this is Chris Beard throwing bones out the friends. Right. Like because because big schools sometimes pay small schools to pay uh, to play them and the small schools benefit from those paychecks that they get from the big schools. So my guess is, hey, Chris Beard wants to help the UT system. My guess is, hey, Chris Beard has probably coached with a lot of the guys who are coaching at these small Texas schools that are on the Longhorn schedule. So throwing them a bone as well and talking about uniting the family and all that stuff that Chris Beard and this program has been about since he took over. So I'm with you. Like, that's a reasonable complaint. But. I do like that, uh, man, you get at least three, if not four, really, really good tests to see what this team is. And, look, they didn't win those last year, right? I mean, Gonzaga and Seton Hall, those were their two toughest before the SEC game against Tennessee. But, like, in the non-con part of the schedule early on, those were the two toughest games. They lost them both. So, hopefully, obviously, two and one would be great. But you don't want to go 0-3 against Gonzaga, Creighton, and Illinois. Like, you, you got to find a win at least uh, against at least one of those teams – uh, to have Texas fans feeling confident that they could take it a step further than they did in year one. I guess real quick, did you watch any of the – whatever FIBA event Global Jam was where ba- – it was basically Team USA was Baylor and played a couple teams. And I know Marcus Carr had some pretty good performances. Did you see anything new to his game from that? He did look pretty good, man. Um, I saw more, you know, I saw a combination of Minnesota and Texas Marcus Carr, which is what I want to see. Like I saw that aggression from Marcus Carr that we saw at Minnesota and we didn't always see that at times last year. And it was a completely different role for Marcus Carr in in Austin versus what he had up there because Minnesota had no talent around him. Like he was their best player by far. So he was basically asked, at least it looked like he was asked to shoot the ball 25, 30 times a game 
Uh, in every clutch game situation, he had the ball in his hands and he was jacking up the shot. So overly aggressive. And then last year at times, it's like, dude, like, where is that? Like, do that. Like, we know you're capable of scoring in these big time situations. You don't have to be so passive. But he was probably asked to be a little bit more passive, to be a little bit more of a point guard, to make sure other guys were getting involved, which is good. He got better at that. But I want I want that aggression. Like what makes Marcus Carr a really good college player is his scoring. He's never going to be like the best true point guard in the country. He's a really, really good scoring guard. So I thought we saw, especially in the clutch, like he had a really good fourth quarter for Team Canada against Baylor, where he damn near single-handedly came back and won that game uh, for Team Canada because he just took over down the stretch. I want to see more of that. Like I don't want to see out of control Marcus Carr, but I want to see more of, hey, man, when your team gets a bucket, you go be the guy who gets a bucket. Uh, yeah, you're yeah. experienced enough. You've been in college forever. You've been in these spots. Go make it happen year two. Now you know what the system is like. You know what this team is. You know the guys around you. Uh, I want to see a little bit more late game aggression from Marcus Carr that'll hopefully turn into more close game wins for Texas. Yeah, I'm curious, you know, especially how that looks with with Tyrese Hunter uh, playing at Texas too, because that was a one of the top prospects, and I think that his, whatever his recruiting class was, and then B became one of the top prospects in in the transfer portal, and one of you know that's where Chris Beard knows that he's going to make a lot of his hay on the recruiting trail at this point. Uh, so. I, I'm, I'm encouraged by it just to see that news. I didn't get to catch a lot of it, but I'm glad he's showing. And granted, remember, he's an older player. Like he's, he's getting older. Like he's going to add more to his game. Uh, he's going to be a guy who's trying to showcase skill that's above Europe right now. Cause that's where he's at. If he left right now, he'd probably be playing in Europe. Probably wants to get to the G league, get to the league. And he's trying to make that progress. And, Sounds like he is a little bit. And also getting a little details on how some of the uh, Baylor Bears play, considering yeah. uh, Scott Drew's squad basically represented the country. Uh, didn't know that's – I didn't vote on that. It was that on the ballot last <laughs> year and we, we missed it? Oh, uh, no, I would have voted against that. I don't want uh, Scott Drew getting extra practice. His teams are good enough as it is. I'm glad you brought up Tyrese Hunter, though, because Tyrese Hunter is a better true point guard than anything Texas had last year. So that should take some of the pressure off Marcus Carr to where he doesn't have to create for himself and others. He's got somebody actually creating for him uh, to take some pressure off of him and take the weight off his shoulders a little bit. So, yeah, no, I just it, I, I think that'll make the entire backcourt, really the entire Texas team more effective, just having a, a, a true point guard on this roster, which you really didn't have a season ago. Yeah, still missing a big man. That still kind of scares me with Drew Timmy coming to town. Yeah, uh, but you know, it should be fun. I'm really curious to see how the Moody Center plays up. And I still, the only time I've been in there is for uh, a the the opening day tour. Um, I know some people who've been in there for concerts, and they said it was great. Um, I know some people who've been in there for uh, WWE Raw, which or SmackDown, excuse me. So a go. sporting event. And they said it was great. I'm curious to see how it plays for, for basketball. And I think if there was any pr like eye popping prices, if I remember right, I think that the university when they're hosting events in there has a little bit more say as to, you know, those prices compared to when it's OVG or live nation running concessions. But um I'm just looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to seeing what it's like, what the student sections like everything. It's, it's a lot of, a lot of excitement around basketball and that's exactly what they needed uh, when they were heading into this building. And it's what they got making it to the second round last year and uh, coming into this year with still pretty high expectations. Yeah. Not a lot of weekend home games. Like the first weekend home game is the game against UT RGV. That's going to be in Gregory. So yeah. like, I, and that's I might... not even going to be open to the uh, season ticket holders. That's yeah. a, that's a student. Well, you have to be a certain type of season. Ticket oh, okay. Okay. Well, you, after... you and I, you and I don't make nearly enough to be uh, that type of yeah. season ticket holder, but yeah, I might have to take off work for the Gonzaga game just, just to get up there and experience it. But I'm pumped. Tell with the concerts, man. I mean, I'm sure I'll go to a couple of concerts there, but like, I, that's not why I'm excited about this place. Like I'm excited to hopefully, and it obviously depends on the fans, but to hopefully have a legit home court advantage. Like at times the Irwin center has had it when Texas is really good or when someone really good comes to town, but I mean, the, the, the drum, the flan, as I call it, just so cavernous. And you got like a smaller building, more compact. People are closer together. Like I, and beer talks about it more than I ever could. You want a home court advantage. You, you want that atmosphere. It really helps your team. The home team feeds off of it everywhere. So hopefully Texas can, 
can get a little bit closer to that this year and obviously beyond as well. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Or uh, we're, we're getting closer and closer to camp starting off. We'll probably start getting into positions next week and uh, having some fun with it. Yeah, no doubt. I think that's it for today's episode. Appreciate y'all listening. As always, make sure you follow Joe on Twitter at josephcook89 and subscribe over at InsideTexas.com, the best Longhorn coverage you can find. Football, basketball, baseball, every sport, they got you covered over at IT. Unbelievable bang for your buck if you subscribe over there. If you haven't done it yet, I don't know what you're waiting for. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Brad Kellner. Listen to The Wheelhouse every weekday from 3 to 7 in ESPN Houston on ESPN Houston. Uh, you can go to ESPN975.com to listen. If you're outside the listening area, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel too. Uh, that's where I do a lot of my Longhorn content these days. All right, for Joe Cook, I am BK Brad Kellner. Thank you all again for listening. Until next time, y'all stay safe. Y'all stay healthy. And hook them.